I'm Brittany. I'm Justine. And we're very drunk. <laughs> <laughs> we're also the host of It's About Damn Crime. A true crime podcast, but with a twist. As minorities ourselves, we wanted to focus more on minority crimes. You know, all the stories you hear way less about. Check us out on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasting on. And remember, there's a lot of desert out there. Cheers. Salud. Hey everyone, welcome back to But Why Though the Podcast, where we talk about the things in pop culture that people say matter and ask the question, but why though? Before we get started, we wanted to make sure to tell y'all to head on over to our Twitter and Instagram at But Why Though PC or our Facebook, facebook.com slash But Why Though PC. That way you can send us your fan But Why Those. Why are you part of a fandom? Why does it matter to you? We want to know and we want to put it up on our website. But if you're looking to support us a little bit more, head over to our Patreon. There you'll get exclusive content, access to your research notes, and even episodes a day to two days early. And if you subscribe at the $3 level, you'll get some merch. But at the end of the day, we're happy just to have you here listening to us. So share us with your friends, share us with your coworkers, share us with your Tinder dates. Just, you know, share us. And uh, enjoy the show. Hey everyone, quick little insight into this episode. We did have an issue with one of our audio tracks, so towards the end, Adrian does sound a little robotic. We apologize, and we won't let it happen again. Hey everyone and happy Halloween. We are releasing this on a not normal day because this is one of the best days of the year and in honor of it, we are going to be talking about one of the most iconic horror movie franchises. I wouldn't call it best and we'll get into that. It is John Carpenter's Halloween that ends up not being John Carpenter's Halloween, but Halloween the franchise. As always, I'm your host Kate and I'm here with Adrian. Hey, how's it going? And Matt. Hello. And our awesome spooky guest, Alex Paterno, host of What We Talk About When We Talk About, a podcast about popular culture, and assignment editor at FrightDay.com. Those are all true things about me. I'm happy. I'm glad <laughs> we didn't come on here and lie about you. <laughs> I got some Actually, right. six five and wears hockey masks on the weekends. There you go. I mean, all the height part is inaccurate, but... <laughs> <laughs> Well, welcome back to the podcast. Thanks. Good to be here again. He was last here with us for our Scream episode, and he actually has a Scream episode out on um, what platforms is what we talk about when we talk about on. Oh, at this point, I think it's on pretty much everything that we have found that hosts podcasts. So iTunes, SoundCloud, uh, Stitcher, Podcast Addict, uh is Podcast FM one or something like that? Player FM. Player FM, I think. We're on Player FM. Yeah, pretty much uh, Overcast. Anything that I could find that hosts a podcast, I tried to make sure that we are available there. So go listen to it. And not just that episode. All of them are pretty damn good, too. So. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, starting off with questions, as we always do, how many of the Halloween movies have you seen? And do you have a specific Michael Myers moment? That just sticks with you. Um, I'll go first because as always, whenever we do anything horror related ever, I can't remember any of the movies <laughs> except for, I guess the newest one. I, I imagine, I don't know. You might be able to help me out which one, what, what it is, Kate, but like, it's like a newer one and the kid is super creepy. We've talked about it before. Rob Zombie Halloween, the reboot of the franchise. Yeah. So what I've is seen- that one called? Halloween. Okay, okay, yeah. That's like the last one I've seen and the only one I can really remember. I mean, I can only remember like seeing like gifs and memes of Mike Myers chasing people and like them tripping on like blades of grass. Um but And that and could that, easily be any other slasher movie too. Yeah. Uh <laughs> but I think I don't know, man. That whole like anything with that every every scene with that kid in it is is scary to me. Like that kid is just creepy. Like he was born just to be a creepy acting kid. Uh, so like all of those moments stick with me. Like I'm thinking about it right now, and I'm, now I'm like, well, 
Yeah, now I can't go to sleep tonight. Thanks. So <laughs> mission, mission accomplished, Kate. That's always my mission for these episodes. What about uh, who? Matt? Here we go. Sure. So I've seen actually most of these movies. I have a very vivid memory of some of them, but not much. So I've seen the first one, Halloween, obviously. The second one, I guess I have seen Halloween 3, which I kind of hope we get to discuss a little bit. Um, ha- I'm not sure if I've seen 4. I know I've seen Halloween 5. I've seen the Halloween H. 2-0 or 20 Which years I'm later. I'm going to say is the best one, but that's just And I want to say I've seen The Curse of Michael Myers with the sixth one. And I don't even remember Resurrection. Buster I'm, Rhymes? Resurrection was, but, not, Bus- the one, was but, not the one with Buster Rhymes. Yes, it was. I just watched it today. Was it? Yeah. That was 20 years later one. Nope. I now have a reason to watch that movie. It's Resurrection. And in the oh, end, but then I have seen yells, Resurrection then. Yeah. Yeah, and in the end, and he yells, burn, motherfucker, burn. I it's need so to this movie. Is, and he has- is Buster Rhymes anything to fuck with in that movie? <laughs> no. Well, what I was trying to say was the only Michael Myers moment that stuck with me was when Buster Rhymes just oh. basically yells yeah, at Michael Myers, but apparently we already know all about this because Kate gladly told us all about this entire Buster <laughs> Rhymes thing. So I have no moments that stick with me. Thank you very much. <laughs> but basically, the best part is he literally he runs into him because he tries to dress up as Michael Myers to be a copycat, and he actually runs into Michael Myers, and he goes, "Let's get in there and let's just scare the shit out of these people and like kill them or something." And Michael just sits there like, "Cool, let's do this." <laughs> and then then he runs off and doesn't actually kill him. <laughs> Wait, now you gave a little thumbs up there. Does Michael Myers actually give a thumbs up? I didn't know. He does not. But it's really I'm hilarious. He kind of sits. Well, because when he kind of sits there with his knife, like he is going to kill him, and you think the whole time he's going to kill him, and then he's like gives him this whole speech, and then he just kind of sits there like this and just doesn't kill him. Just kind of like puts down, like just stares at him and doesn't say anything. Kind of like okay, uh, that's, that's phenomenal. But yeah, I didn't say that part. That was the only part I had left. We can say <laughs> I, I didn't cut out mine. You could have just reset it. It's already been said. So you want me to leave that all in? Doesn't matter. But you know, that was my one moment. That stuck with me. The best I, I don't I don't like any of these like scary movies, but I would just die if I saw Buster Rhymes and Mike Myers just chilling. You need to like YouTube that ever. clip. It is like the one of the best clips. Which that is surprising because our- the movie's probably not that great. That should go in our show notes, Kate. I'll put in the show notes. And actually, uh, Halloween Resurrection is streaming right now on HBO Now. So, oh no way! I'll have to watch yep. that. I'm what sorry. about you, Alex? <laughs> yeah. So, okay. We so here's anything the thing. for you? <laughs> no, I I've actually only watched one Halloween movie, which is not a lot because it's why, one. Why did I invite you here? Because before I started watching horror movies, the thing that I could handle was reading about them. So while I haven't seen any of the Halloween movies, I've read every single Wikipedia article on them. (laughs) Have you read Uh, the novelizations? No, I haven't. But I think that it's fascinating that those even happened. Uh, Honestly, the the production history of Halloween fascinates me more than the movies. Okay, because I ha- absolutely have none of that here, so like, feel free to let us know. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. No, just all the stuff about John Carpenter and his relationship with it and everything. Uh, but the Halloween moment that sticks with me is probably the end of the first one when Loomis runs over and Michael's not laying on the lawn. <laughs> the only because, like, while Michael isn't, like, supernatural until halfway through the series, that, to me, was like, no, that dude got shot and then fell a story onto just like some real hard dirt. Like he wouldn't get up and just run off like that probably. So at, like in my mind at that point, that's when he, they started establishing him as supernatural. And also what a creepy and upsetting thing to be like, Oh, I shot that guy. He fell out of a window and now he's gone. Yeah. yeah. Also probably one of the other moments, which is, I don't know how much a moment, but the fact that like, Basically, it starts with he killed his sister, I believe, and put her in a washing machine or a dryer to kill her. That's a Rob Zombie edition. Yeah, that's Rob Zombie. Okay. I think in the original, he just stabs her a few times, yeah, right? Yeah, he just stabs so, yeah, her. That's what, okay, so he that just is stabs her, then. and she's naked, and it's POV, so there's like a lot well, of... Well, I know like, that. So that's what I thought about the original one, but I thought they showed that, so that was the Rob Zombie one then? Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's all blended together because they made so many of them. Well, 
we'll get into it later, but I actually think Rob Zombie's additions to it, I think are really good, which I know is heresy in the horror community for the most part, because Halloween, the first one is seen as a classic, but I actually think Rob Zombie's aren't as bad as people say. So that's, that's consistent with what I hear. Yeah, the so. rest of his filmography up for debate. Well, yes. not the rest of it. Some of it is definitely Some good. of it is just trash. Like Yeah, 31. I, yeah. Yeah. Oh, gosh. Okay. So how many have I seen? I went ahead, and as I start with all our episodes that involve movies, I watched pretty much all of them today. Um, I skipped around in Halloween 3, and I watched all of 4, and then I decided I didn't like what they do with the new final girl they bring in. So I skipped five and six and then went straight to um, Halloween H2O 20 years later and resurrection. Um, so I've pretty much seen everything except for two. So I think that's pretty good. Um, my favorite Michael Myers moment has got to be at the end of Halloween H2O where Jamie Lee Curtis, they have this moment because at this point, you know that they're their brother and sister. And there's this moment where she has completely lost it, knows that he's not really dead, and then drives off in the coroner's van and he pops up. And so she drives the van off a hill and it, he ends up flying through the window and getting pinned next to a tree. And he looks at her and they like touch hands and then she grabs the axe and cuts off his head. And it's awesome. That wasn't actually him, though. I know. That's what I was going to say. But then it's ruined in Resurrection because it was not actually him. It drove her crazy. And then she dies, which sucks. <laughs> it's it's rough. It, it's really rough. Um, but I, yeah, I think probably my favorite moment after that would just have to be the closet scene uh, in the first Halloween. Where oh, Lori the, is that the knitting needle? Uh, no, no, that's the knitting needle is when she's sitting on the floor in front of the couch and then right. she runs upstairs into the closet. So Lori Strode runs into hide in a closet and it has those little slats and yeah. Michael Myers just punches through the slats and is going ham on like the clothes and everything. And you're seeing it from her POV and it's just really disturbing. Yeah. Also, <laughs> I want to, I want to change my Mike Myers moment. Uh, <laughs> my favorite Michael Myers moment is one that happens off camera. And it's when he brings a tombstone into the house and sets it up on the bed for, like, the drama of it. And then lays the body out and next to it all like, night. That's a thing he had to take the time to do, and it is insane. So Michael Myers is extra. Very. He also, repeat like, he repeatedly steals cars from people, too. Like, he's not your Jason Voorhees, like, stumbling around. Like, he's oh, like, actually stealing cars and crap. He grew up in an asylum. How does he know how to drive? Yeah, that is true. Because from 6 to 21, he's put away. Yeah. Yeah. Also, if you're that big at 21, you really miss, like, a, a big athletic career. Yeah. <laughs> so... Getting into the, I guess, the meat of it, which we've already kind of started touching on, but we'll go ahead and flesh this out for you. So the franchise started in 1978 with John Carpenter's Halloween, and the franchise and its villain have pretty much become, like everything we talk about, pop culture staple, staples. And even if you're not within the horror community, even if you hate horror, if you see that white William Shatner mask, you can probably peg that as Michael Myers. And there are eight movies in the original series. I would say seven, because one of them has nothing to do with anything. And then there are two reboots that are floating out there in the world, so 10 total. And then a third reboot, or uh, there's two reboot films, and then there's the third one that's coming up. Yep, you jumped ahead to the end of the show. Yeah, it's, I'm very excited <laughs> to talk about that because there's there's a lot going on there, I feel like, for me. I'm super excited for it, which yeah. we can get into. But yes, there is another one on the way. It, Like Michael Myers, this franchise just keeps popping back up. Or Hollywood has ran out of ideas, and I'm tired of reboots. Yes, that too. Uh, Halloween H2O is the worst title of a movie it is. I've ever heard in my life. It is. And that's coming yeah. from a guy who loves Fast and the Furious franchise. <laughs> like, that is like nothing compared like, it is. It, Fast it, Five it, is not as bad as 
Halloween H two O. Is there like literally, water in that episode? They literally yeah. called it H two O when it was released. Well, they it's, didn't it's even H- a Halloween. It's H twenty. Yeah, I say first of all, or there's nothing Halloween. wrong with how Fast and the Furious names its movies. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't it's think one of my, so. It's I mean, one if you of my favorite Fast and the Furious episode, I think the Japanese titles are better than the American titles. I remember that. I loved it. Uh, second, yeah. was it actually marketed as H two O or was it Halloween H twenty? It was H twenty, but it I refuse H20. to say that it's H two O. Yeah. Like, what were they thinking? Like, did they not test that? Did they, they did they not market to see? Hey, what does this what does this sound like to you? It made the most money in the theaters out of any of them. So really? is that involving inflation? Yeah. Because nineteen seventy eight and nineteen ninety eight could mean a giant difference. Uh, have oh. to check the Wikipedia. I'll look into it. Well, yeah, look into it. I, 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 I just want to get that out there because that just sounds awful. And if like they're like underwater or there's any water involved, no, in that movie, they it didn't sounds know. terrible. Yeah, okay, similar so- to how Jason X is Jason in space, Halloween H two O takes place in Atlantis. <laughs> <laughs> wait, I would watch that. Wait, wait. Now, now my interest is peaked. Like, <laughs> right? Crossover. I would watch that. <laughs> like, um. So I will. I guess I just kind of want to come right out of the gate and say that the Halloween franchise is nothing like the Jason franchise. <laughs> And it doesn't lean as hard into the things until like resurrection. And even then it's not Jason in space. I mean, I still don't know how Jason X seemed like a good idea to anybody. I mean, it has one of the best kills. He like freezes that, that, that woman's head in a vat of um, liquid nitrogen and then like cracks it on the table. That is really good. It's a really good kill. Some fatality level stuff right there like it's one of my favorite kills in horror crappy like garbage fire of a movie but a good kill um so it's one that i have not forced myself to watch honestly i i don't think i can bring myself to watch it i watched it when it came out with my cousins because i mean i've talked about on the podcast before like my family just loves horror um and now i'm making sure i say that second syllable and i'm so self-conscious about it i know i'm gonna say horror like 10 times in this episode (laughs) So when you like made this choice to go see this, did you actually think this was a good idea? I was pretty young when it came out. It, we watched it on like VHS or whatever. But once again, did you actually think this was a good idea? No. Okay. Nobody thought it was a good idea. But it's Jason killing people, which I think if you stay with slashers long enough, you're just there to watch the kills. Uh, just, just for people who are curious, I looked up on Box Office Mojo. And adjusted for inflation, it is Halloween at a hundred and seventy-nine million, and then Halloween H two O at one hundred and four, and then kind of just like goes down from there. Okay. But Halloween okay. adjusted for inflation made a lot of money. Okay. Yeah. 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 Well, nineteen seventy. Yeah. It and also should be said Halloween was made on like a micro budget. Yes, yes. it was. It was made for three hundred twenty-five thousand was the initial, and then it grossed seventy thousand uh, seventy million. And then to capitalize off of that, um, that's the reason we have Jason is because of Michael Myers. Yeah. Let's talk about a synopsis. And I promise if you're listening and you're like, oh, no, Kate is synopsizing things again. This is going to take forever. It's not because it's pretty much a one sentence plot for every single movie. Michael Myers wants to kill his family. The end. That is the gist of everything <laughs> uh, kate since you watch a bunch of these movies today what movie is it that they established michael's whole backstory and that that's his purpose they don't really i thought that there or is it in one of the novelizations so, where they establish okay. that he's like under a curse or whatever no so I thought, i've so heard the you, curse it, idea yeah, but i don't so know when, what so the for. curse idea is in six which i didn't watch today but its title is the okay. curse of michael myers and i read the wikipedia summary for it but when it comes down to um, actually his his whole motive to kill his family mm-hmm. and getting to know that Laurie Strode is actually a sister, that actually doesn't happen until pretty much the end of Halloween 2. So yeah. you go the first movie not knowing why the hell he's targeting Laurie, and then you go most of 2 not knowing, and then they just insert family members. Yeah, because he's basically like undying until his whole family's dead, right? Yes. Which, I mean, I don't know. It feels like a toss-up. Like, he's only trying to kill a very specific group of people other than, like, anyone who gets in his way of that. So, like, do you just sacrifice the Strode family? (laughs) 
Yes. Yes, you do. You put them like on a platter, say, here, Michael, kill these people instead of killing like the 20 other that will get in your way. And there you go. And then you and then you kill him. And it's the sacrifice of the few for the benefit of the many. Exactly. It's the trolley problem. Sadly, I get it. Like <laughs> it the trolley problem is actually a deep philosophical concept, and we just oh, went there sure. with Halloween. So Michael wants I, to kill I'm, his family. I, yeah. <laughs> yes. So Michael wants to kill his family. But if you want a little bit more of information, I have something prepared that isn't 30 minutes long, like my usual synopses. So here we go. The series itself is focused around Michael Myers, who killed his older sister, Judith. And after that happens, he's committed to a sanitarium, which is what everything calls it, which I think was the term back then. And 15 years later, he escapes on Halloween. Uh, well, pri like, yeah, he escapes on Halloween, and then he begins killing people in the town of Haddonfield, while being chased by his psychiatrist, Dr. Loomis, who is highly invested in him. Um, it's kind of weird. And then from here, you get the main target being Laurie Strode. And she's the center of his killing spree. And as Alex said, he pretty much kills whoever gets in his way. And then in Halloween 4, the franchise switches the protagonist to being Laurie's daughter, who she gave up for adoption. And in her, her storyline... You have Michael Myers established as being a supernatural supernatural being who will always come back until his entire family's dead. And then in Halloween H2O, Halloween 20 years later, you have the culmination of everything. And here we see an adult Lori who is a, who has a grown son, an established life. She's the headmistress of this like prep high school. And she's also a, a functioning alcoholic suffering from PTSD. And this comes out after Scream. And I kind of feel like this is in the new era of slasher where kind of looking at what your, um, what your protagonist has been going through is kind of already established. Because we mm -hmm. don't see Lori really dealing with this in 2. But then again, 2 is a direct sequel and happens like moments after the first one. Yeah. So they might not have had room to do that. Yeah. And I will say, in terms of the concept of if you're going to do a 20 years later, I love the idea of taking a final girl and saying, like, not only did she survive it, it didn't follow her for this long, but still here's how it impacted her. Yes. Yeah. So because like she that goes is a good 20 idea years. for a movie. Yeah. Because she goes, tw it has been in the movie, it's established that she has had 20 years of not having to deal with Michael Myers. And yet she still is like a super controlling mom for her son and doesn't let him celebrate Halloween, doesn't let him go out because she still has that looming fear of him, even though she personally has not had to deal with him. Um, and it's just a true 90s slasher and I really love it. To me, that's my favorite one. Which one? H2O. Oh, okay. Yeah, it, it, it's actually a really well done movie, I think. Then you have Halloween Resurrection, which is the first piece in the franchise where you don't really get because he kills Laurie in the beginning, but he's still alive and he died but didn't die at the end. And the entire focus of this is just the Halloween franchise needed to make a look how technology takes, um, look how technology acts in a horror movie now. And they do like, with these, uh, like these proto, like spy camera type things that they equipped with all the contestants, because the contestants are mm. spending a night in the Myers house and recording it all live online, thinking that Michael Myers is dead, but really he's just been chilling in the basement. Best part is when the girl loses her head and starts bobbing down the stairwell, and everybody's like, "Wow, that is great graphics." It pans back and forth from in the house with them to having people watching it at a Halloween party. And there's just, oh, oh, wow, that's not really happening. Or I wonder how they did that. Yeah, they're like, how'd they get her head huh. to pop all the way down the stairs? And then well, first at, you cut it off. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> and then at the end, at the end of it, you actually have where they're using Palm Pilots, which I forgot were a thing until I watched this movie today. And they're like communicating between this guy who is essentially catfishing her. 
and is telling her that, you know, Michael's behind you, turn around, that kind of stuff. And that's it. Yay! That was done. very succinct. Yeah. I tried. <clears throat> I get made fun of when it's not. So, And it wasn't from Wikipedia. That was just me watching all the damn movies today. <laughs> so to put it into perspective for that part of the franchise, you have... In 19, uh, like I said, 1978, Halloween, that has a 93% rating. 1998, 1981, yeah, 1981, you have Halloween 2 sitting at a 31%. Um, that rating like, surprised me. That's actually yeah. very surprising, yeah. I thought so too, because I actually thought Halloween 2 is pretty damn good. That's especially what I for a sequel. Yeah. And especially knowing, do we want to get a little bit into the production side of things here, real quick? Oh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so, okay, John Carpenter wrote Halloween, and then in his mind, Halloween 2 was the end of the of those characters. Like, it was yep. done. He wanted one story told between two movies and, like, put a lot of creativity into it. There's a lot of artistic integrity in that because he did have a vision for it. And from everything I've ever read about it, I'm watching it this weekend, it's a good movie. So 31% yeah. on Rotten Tomatoes just feels just so wrong. Yep. But I don't know. Adjust, adjusted for gross, it's the third highest grossing movie of the franchise. Huh. Just for kind of perspective wise. So I'm not sure why it has 37% if it made, you know, that much well, money. See, and uh, that's the thing. Almost all of these, with the exception of the first Halloween, are really, really low scores. Where does Halloween 3 fall on the the overall gross? Please last. Adrian. Uh, Halloween 3 in the overall gross does is six so uh, not as bad as it could be yeah yeah and are we talking about halloween 2 like the 81 halloween 2 or yes, halloween 2 81. like rob zombies okay 81. I, I, I just saw two halloweens here and now i'm realizing that the one that came out in 09 is seven on the list so the one that was in 81 is three so okay. and halloween three season of the witch which is also another horrible title um without <laughs> having any like knowledge of the movies is is number six how about you go watch that movie and then you'll realize why that yeah. is like the so we'll, we'll, disaster. Yeah, so we'll you get said, into that. You said Sister in a Dryer, so I'm not watching any of these movies. No, no, that that's the first that's the first Rob Zombie film. <laughs> What's weird about that is that someone gets murdered in a dryer in the 1981 film My Bloody Valentine. Yes. So like even Zombie doing that isn't necessarily an original kill, which is uh, just to me very interesting from a production standpoint. Well, one of the things that I found, or that I have found in the zombie movies, is that I think they do lend from the fact that he's such a big horror fan, and that's what hurts it a lot of the time, mm -hmm. because he borrows too much. Like, Devil's Rejects could have been so much better than it was, but the Firefly family was so much borrowed from Leatherface's family that you end up with mm -hmm. some too much overlap that it doesn't actually become its own thing. And I just remember, because I remember the dryer scene only because how bloody they made it. Yeah, it is really that's oh, said, interesting. That's it is That's really the reason intense. I remember the dryer scene, not so much the thing, because gotcha. it's like way over the top compared to like anything else. Yeah. And if I remember right, in my Bloody Valentine, you just see the body getting carried out or like yeah. zipped up in a bag, but you don't actually like see a whole lot of blood with it. It's like kind of graphic, but not that bad. See, and so that's another thing that I do want to point out. And I, since we're on Halloween 2, I'll say it. Halloween 2, the only thing I didn't like about it was Michael Myers is literally killing people with a scalpel the entire time. And there's this one kill where he stabs somebody with the scalpel and like lifts him up. And I'm like, how the hell are you doing that? It's a scalpel. Stabs him, stabs him where? Like the under back. the chin? The oh, okay. Never back. mind. That's nonsense. That is complete nonsense. He stabs him in the back and then lifts him up. And the camera zooms in on his feet to show that he's being were pulled you, up off of the floor. Were you sure that was a st scalpel kill though? Yeah, it okay. was a scalpel okay. kill. Because I do know exactly what scene it was. I just didn't remember if it was. Yeah, it was. I think it was like the third scalpel kill because okay. there's this one point where he's just killing with the scalpel, like right in the middle. Because I, I like, rewound I it because I was like, that doesn't make sense. I would almost prefer him yeah, watching people with a fire extinguisher. He got shot six times and then got up in the field, you said, but it's the scalpel part that <laughs> is. <laughs> That's fair. Like the, dude got, like the dude got shot six times and fell off a first story when my thing and still kill people. If I saw a scalpel, I'd be like, that's pretty meta. He's, he's trying to think of some new ways to kill people. That's amazing. <laughs> because it's a combination of the knitting needle and the kitchen knife. Yes. <laughs> but see, look, there oh, you gosh. go. It's all thematic. He's Again, he's very committed to the drama of what's going on. <laughs> anyway, so 
Um, that got a nice 31% rating. In 1982, you have Halloween 3, Season of the Witch, sitting at a 37%. This is not a Halloween franchise movie. It is a Halloween movie, as in it deals with the holiday. Some people say that it's their, it, it's one of the best like holiday-centric movies that they've seen, but I could not detach myself from the fact that I was watching it back to back with all of the all of the franchise. Like it doesn't belong there. It it's it it and it's just weird. It is really weird. Like the first twenty minutes, I was like, I don't know what's on my screen right now. I can't do this. And then there's that stupid song. I told you you're gonna love that song. Eight more days till Halloween. Eight more days till Halloween. 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 Gonna, spoiler alert! If you let me choose the outro song, <laughs> <laughs> I kept telling her, "Do not watch this movie," and you're gonna get the song stuck in your head. Just do not watch this movie. And what did she do? She watched the movie, said, "Oh my gosh, this is awful!" Like I said, and then she got the song stuck in her head. Also, like I said. Yes. I So, like, after I watched Moana, I just kept singing You're Welcome, like, all around the house. It's and a great after, song. <laughs> and then after I watched this movie, I just kept singing that stupid ha- Halloween song over and over. But brings me another point, because we've talked about a lot of different franchises, I guess. Why does the third movie always seem to be such a weird thing? We talked about Resident Evil, which the third movie detracts. Fast and the Furious, which the third movie is totally different. This have, series was is totally different. I have a theory, and I think it's because the majority of horror franchises are not, and just, just within horror, Adrian can speak to Fast and the Furious, but just within horror, the majority of franchises are not meant to go past two films. And exactly. so they jump directors, and they jump writers, and they change it, and it sucks. Which leads to another thing. I believe Josh 3 is also the one where they put him in the stupid aquarium. If I am correct. Does Jaws kill people from the aquarium? Yes, he also makes roar no- noises like he's a tiger. Okay, that part I'm not mad about, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Why he's swimming? Arr. <laughs> oh, the sound uh, bite, though. To- Tokyo Drift is amazing, and they tie it back into the franchise. So. I love Tokyo Drift. Well, Tokyo they Drift. eventually tie it Tokyo back Drift. in there, but when it is released at that moment, you're like, what is this? Uh, uh, nope, it was always tied in because the end scene has been diesel in it. it so it's that, always... I mean, that's fine if you tie it in, but it's completely and the little bow wow. first two. It's a solid movie, bow-wow. and the Teriyaki Boys song is awesome. What do you mean by and Teriyaki the, Boys? That's the name of the People band. It's that Fast and the no, it's Tokyo. Yeah, they're in Tokyo. They're like the Teriyaki Boys. It's amazing. It's, it's it, it is song. amazing. He has and harmonies there. <laughs> it's it's connected. I have a great falsetto, Alex. Um, <laughs> it, it's it's great. But I, I definitely see what you're saying. Like, and I think Kate's right. Like, you shouldn't. Most movies aren't supposed to go past two movies, and for whatever reason, they do. Yeah. No. But, In a great franchise like Fast and Furious, they make it work. Yeah. Quick bit of horror history. Two franchises that were actually meant to be anthology franchises, Friday the 13th and Halloween. So the first Friday the 13th movie, Mrs. Voorhees is the killer. Second one, Jason's the killer. Third one, he finally gets the hockey mask. But after the second one, the or after the first one even, the idea was that these are always going to be different things. And Friday the 13th is just a cursed day that terrible things happen on. But then after... After that joke appearance of Jason at the end of the first one, they wanted him in the second movie, so they put him in. And then they refused to break from the Voorhees story for the rest of the franchise. It was supposed to just be different stuff every year and an annual film so that it becomes like an event for people to go see the new Friday the 13th. And then Halloween, John Carpenter did one, did two, said my story is done. I will only help out with three if it is disconnected from Michael, which is why we got season of The Witch. That makes sense now. Uh, but Carpenter didn't write it or direct it. He only no, produced he it. Yeah. That makes sense now. And Maybe in the realized... Halloween movie, it's okay, even though it's a very weird concept. But... I, I can explain it really easily. If you've seen Goosebumps, there's that one episode where the girl goes and buys a mask from a magic shop, and it ends up getting stuck it's on her episode. face and coming alive. It's one of my favorite episodes, and that is essentially what this is. Why am I blanking on the name of that episode? I don't remember. I was so young when I watched it. I remember Night in Terror Tower for some reason, but I... 
Is it like Night of the Mask? I think it's Night oh, of the it's Mask. Oh, it's the Haunted Mask. The Haunted Mask. Yeah. Which How is original. very predictable. Yeah. Yeah. Which is pretty much what this is. Um, but again, like Matt said, it might be fine by itself, but. But ha- having that Halloween moniker attached to it definitely taints it in a weird way. Like by trying to lend it credibility, they hurt it. Yeah. It's awful. <laughs> Adrian, do not see this movie. Six more days till Halloween. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so they basically, after that one tanked, and because a lot of people left those movies just like confused as to why Michael wasn't in them, that's why they returned to Michael for four. Right. Yeah. And they abandoned the idea that this could be an anthology. That said, <laughs> they got further than Friday the 13th did with no longer being about, uh, one person. Yeah, it was funny because I actually saw I because I I live tweet everything now. Um, somebody commented the way they could fix that movie is to make Michael show up at the end. And that now I know that it was like I I completely spaced when I read it, but like that's totally a Friday the Thirteenth thing. Yeah. <laughs> um. So moving right along, you have Halloween Four: Return of Michael Myers in 1988. So there's a six year gap. And this sits at a beautiful 29%. Yeah, some of these ratings were confusing because how low they are that I wasn't sure what you actually put on there. Yeah, they're extremely low. Matt, that was my exact thought process looking at this. Was like, are these ratings? Yeah. I thought they were rating because that's usually how she puts them, but then they were like super low that I was confused. These are all critic ratings, by the way, so. But they're so, we'll get there. There's one of these that is brutal. Yeah. Yeah. So... Halloween 5 in 1989, the following year, The Revenge of Michael Myers at 14. It's going lower. And that's not the brutal one. And in 1995, uh, 1995, The Curse of Michael Myers. Coming in, knocking out of the park at 6%. It's so bad. And, like, I didn't watch it, so I can't speak on it. Cause... I've seen it, but it was so long ago. I mean, even... It's 2000- the one that brings in San Ham, right? Yeah. Just not a direction they should have ever gone with it. But no, no, it. They, they, yeah. I would have bought Immortal My- Michael Myers honestly without an explanation for it. Right, I didn't need an explanation. It was just this unstoppable killing machine. When I think you're six deep in a series, now trying to explain why he keeps staying alive, maybe don't do it. Yeah, this is also making me think that most slashers shouldn't go past three. Exactly. <laughs> um, and then you have a, uh, in 1998, a full 20 years after the first one, Halloween H20 or H20, uh, 20 years later, and that is a 51%. So better than the others. You know what? I'm thinking Rotten Tomatoes didn't even exist back in 1982, and so they threw a number on half these movies. It's a critic score. Critic rating systems have been in place. They were doing a lot of coke in the eighties. I don't know. <laughs> like these scores, like to me, are kind of like super low. I just don't even, like as bad of movies we have. Like fourteen. I mean, a thirty-one for the second one is kind of like that's just. These are like Adrian. Since I know you're muted, look up other ratings. <laughs> even like, Transformers think... movies have higher than these. <laughs> that has explosions. Yeah. And honestly, Geo Storm that just came out has now? a. Are you bad mouthing one of our most listened to episodes on this? Wait, wait, I want to hear Matt talk about Geostorm. (laughs) (laughs) Geostorm, I believe, has a higher rating than three of these movies. It does. Um, So so they make a hell of a recovery in 1998 and go from 6% to 51%. Exactly. And honestly, I think it has to do with bringing back Jamie Lee Curtis because I'm like, I'm she's probably a wonderful actress or whatever, but like the jamie is like a little girl in the first one and Daniel somehow Harris, like, yeah. yeah she somehow ages like a crap ton in only seven years um for the next one that she's in and it's just it's it's really weird and i don't like her and i can't get behind it and maybe it's because i don't like children in horror movies you think it was a nostalgia like, factor yeah i especially because it's an anniversary edition like even the title alone is is an anniversary thing because i mean everybody that loved the first one i'm sure like they may not have got along with like the whole curse and everything else but to have like a whole like we're just going to try to play up it's an anniversary type thing we're going to try to maybe go back to their roots type yeah i can easily see that i can definitely see that that's probably Mm -hmm. why it's 
I mean, and honestly, like, I think it, I think it is also just a really great close on like that circle. Like it, it's just a really great closing thing. Um, and then you have Halloween Resurrection. This movie's only saved because Buster rhymes. Yes, it is. Everything At else 12%. in that movie is awful. At twelve percent. <laughs> oh, by the way, fun fact: LL Cool J has never died in any of the in any of the horror movie he's been in because he is in H two O and he's a struggling writer and it's awesome and I love him so much. <laughs> so uh, then you get the Rob Zombie stuff, which is pretty much the story retold. The only difference is that you wind up with a lot more backstory of little Mikey. And I love little Mikey. He's creepy as can be. And it kind of gets you into why all this happens. Like he's bullied at school. His mom's a stripper. His dad like is alluded to beating them. And he, instead of just killing his older sister, he kills everybody that's in the house at that time, including his father, okay. and purposefully spares Lori. And so in unlike with Carpenter's Halloween, it is set up from the very, very beginning that they're siblings and that they that he loves her. And instead of it, it instead of it being I need to kill Lori type thing, with the way this ends in that third act where he gets her, it changes to a more of like a Frankenstein's monster connection with her. Like he loves her, but he's probably going to kill her. And they remove the the awesome um, gravestone in the bed thing. And instead he has the gravestone in the basement where he's like holding her hostage. So. I literally only remember the dryer and him killing a family from these movies if I've seen them. Yeah. And, and they're also extremely graphic. I realized, I didn't realize that there was a Halloween 2 that he did. I didn't realize that. I tried to rent it, but you could only buy it. And it was $12, and I wasn't going to do that to myself. Oh, nope. Don't. <laughs> like, even these have, like, higher scores than this. Like, at a 25 for Halloween, the first one, 2007, you tell me it's only literally six points lower than Halloween 2 from 1981? Yep. And no, then 2000... Quite... Yeah, and then the, the second one is at 19%. Okay, question for you. I know that in terms of his filmography, Rob Zombie tends to put a southern white trash spin on everything. How much does he do that with Halloween? That's their that that's Michael Myers' entire family. Yeah. Fun. Yeah. It just it like it's Rob Zombie's one it's the one trick that he has. And I feel like Halloween doesn't strike me as the franchise that would benefit from it. Well, see, this is the thing. It works. Because when you know about serial killers, that type of family is usually where they come from. That's true. When he was insane. So, well, I mean, he's still insane here. You just know well, why. Well, not insane. why he became insane. Basically, like I said, the very first one, you find out he just happened to kill his sister and they never said anything. They walked yeah. away. And he just looked like there was something wrong with him and that was it. Which is pretty much the. So. In the Rob Zombie reboot camp, there are people who are just with Matt that like. Carpenter did it perfect by not telling us why Lori was targeted because we didn't know we were in her shoes. Well, and it made him more menacing. Whereas this one humanized him and they didn't really like that because slashers are mm -hmm. almost always just maniac killer. You know nothing about them. That's just how it is. Plot unravels at the end. They tell you why they're going to kill you and that's it. Um, or mindless killing. And then with this one, Rob Zombie really tried to flesh out the story, which is really similar to what happens in the novelizations of the movies, where they actually detail uh, Michael Myers' time in the institution. And I just like serial killer stuff, so I, I, I want to know why somebody got that way. I get and that. it was pretty well done. So, Except he killed Danny Trejo. I'm not going to forgive him for that, because I love Danny Trejo. Uncle Machete? Okay, so now that we've covered the entire franchise today, we have our But Why Those. So, honestly, we've already talked about success pretty much this entire time, that it was made on a super low budget, and it grossed a lot, a lot of money. So, in total, this entire franchise has made $396 million total, which is actually sad because it's not higher than some one-off movies that are completely terrible. But mm -hmm. it's a genre film that tends to happen with genre franchises. Um, so, and then I put here the highest grossing being H2O. We know that that is not true when you adjust for inflation. So. 
you know, also is interesting. What? We're now doing a Scream, a Halloween episode, and you've done a horror episode, and yet something that is tops all of them is Jaws, and you still have not done a Jaws episode. I told you to do one. So, in other media, like I said, you have the novelizations, which started in 1978 and cover the first four films. And then there's also a young adult book series by an author the name of Kelly O'Rourke. It's completely out of continuity for the entire franchise, but it pretty much just deals with, like, college age to, like, te- I, think te- I think there's one teenage one where they have to pretty much deal with this. It's like thriller slasher young adult books. Um, And then you also have comic book series. There's quite a few. I didn't feel like listing them all because I go too long on things. And these aren't terribly interesting. And then um, you also have a video game that was made in 1983. And then the characters from the franchise have been utilized as playable characters in other games. All that being said, we always talk about stuff that has an impact on things, and Halloween's impact on horror is very, very notable. It didn't start the slasher genre, it didn't revolutionize it per se, like Scream or Black Christmas did in both those things, but it did add essential pieces to what we know today as slashers, as well as inspiring some of the ones that we have in the Horror Hall of Fame. So, first up, is it introduced teens as the victims? Because up until this point, the slasher genre focused primarily on college students or people that are accepted as being adults. And in Halloween, you're dealing with teens in high school who have their whole lives ahead of them, which somehow makes it in, which somehow makes it more uncomfortable or should make it more uncomfortable for the viewer. And then um, this essentially ushers in the era of teen screams that we get. I like how basically if you're 17, oh, no, that's horrible. But if you're now 18 or 19 in a college, we don't care whether you die. Pretty much. Yeah, pretty much. Well, the one of the reasons that it's done is because, like, all the conversations they have are about classes and books and school and those types of things. So, they, like, they constantly remind you that their entire life's ahead of them. Whereas in things before this, they're just kind of there and they have their own choices it's 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 really mm-hmm. weird so um like specifically in black christmas um which speaking of did you know that halloween is kind of like a weird unofficial sequel to black christmas what so the guy who did black christmas uh had also collaborated with john carpenter on something after black christmas and they talked about would you ever do a sequel and he said no and then he kind of explained what his vision for a sequel would have been and it was basically it's a year later the guy was caught escaped And this all starts happening again, but this time it's happening on Halloween. Oh. And so while it's not like a perfect copy of the plot of Halloween, it's like similar enough that it's like, oh, that conversation probably planted some idea in John Carpenter's head about a movie to make. Yeah, that's actually Um, really awesome. And also, I like the idea of just like a holiday killer. Yeah. So like, oh, now I just want an an anthology series with a different killer for each holiday. Oh, I'm thinking one killer who just only kills on holidays and he gets real extra about whatever holiday it is. We have April Fool's Day, My Bloody Valentine, Halloween, Black Christmas, uh, You Are Not Alone, which just came out like a year ago and that's like a 4th of July slasher. We can do this. We can make it happen. I'm down. (laughs) I like this idea. Um, So you also get the introduction of the supernatural killer. The one that cannot be stopped. So although it isn't solidly supernatural, as we've said already until midway through the series, the entire first movie deals with Loomis telling cops that Michael Myers is somehow less than human. He describes Michael Myers' eyes, how talking with him, he knows that he's more of an animal than a human. And so you have his psychiatrist Loomis painting him in this picture the entire time. And then as we've said, it ends with Loomis shooting him six times and him surviving. Um, And so... I think Alex is absolutely right when he says he's kind of established as being supernatural right off the bat. He just doesn't have a reason for it. And so that obviously carries into a lot of the um, slashers that we have now, uh, or we had in the 90s, (laughs) 80s and 90s, not now. The slashers are gone now. You also get probably one of the largest tropes in horror and one that 
uh, Scream does a lot of picking apart too, is that you punish the misbehave. Yeah. Um, and that is that the victims in this movie, all of them die when they're doing something wrong. So it's, um, this even includes his sister Judith, who was having sex with her boyfriend prior to being killed, and she's naked when she gets killed. And then you have, um, one of them being a young, uh, a teenager who is shirking off her responsibility for babysitting to go pick up her boyfriend in order to have sex in the house. Two characters who came over to have sex in the house and are drinking. Um, and then, yeah, like it, it, it's everything that you're not supposed to do is built up as a reason for being killed. And there's been a lot of commentary on this. Um, I haven't done the extensive reading that I should have, but it just has to do with um, this era and the fear of value losing, which is horror reflects the culture that it's in and this type of teenage behavior that was something those people were, that were thinking about. Um, and just real quickly, killer POV is introduced in Friday the 13th. And Friday the 13th, as well as having one of the most memorable end scenes, also has one of the most memorable starting scenes where it is just from the eyes of six-year-old Michael walking through the house and killing. Um, and it's really, really cool. Um, it's a product of its time. It is mm -hmm. kind of dated when you watch it. Yes. But <laughs> for the time, um, it was revolutionary in that aspect. Yeah. And then finally... Finally, finally, the thing I always talk about in our, on every episode about horror, the final girl. And I'm bringing it up this time because the final girl that we have in our mind today is set up by J um, Jamie Lee Curtis's portrayal of Laurie Strode because this is what sits the final girl as not just being the person who survives at the end, but being the most perfect of the people in the cast to survive death, which is what makes her ability to overtake the killer that much more. So Lori herself is the good girl. She doesn't invite anybody over to her house. She does her responsibility. She takes care of the kids. She, pri um, she privileges their safety over hers. She's a studious person. She is just an all around good kid. And that's what makes her the survivor. This is the whole thing that virgins don't get killed. And so that trope and the structuring of the final girl in that way comes directly from Halloween. Because prior to that, you do have final girls. So the main character in Black Christmas. She, but she I don't remember if she had an abortion or she was going to get an abortion. It was one of those two things. Like it was established that she wasn't necessarily like the values character. Um, yeah. But she's your final girl. Um, and there was no assumption of values onto this survivor, and now there is. Um, yes. Yeah, and that leads directly into Scream Queen, Jamie Lee Cur Curtis, who is the daughter of Alfred Hitchcock heroine Janet Lee. She was 19 when the film first came out, and it pushed her towards stardom, and I actually really liked her quote about it. She says that Halloween <laughs> placed her on the mountaintop and just let her do everything after this. Um, she had the entire world in front of her. So this movie itself also begins this era of, um, I think I think this is where Calling People Scream Queens starts. And you have like, um, I think retroactive Scream Queens like Tippi Hedren, but this mm -hmm. is the idea that an actress in a movie, not just the final girls, but an actress who is in a whole bunch of horror movies. And that's one of the things that she's known for, if not the main thing that she's known for. Yeah. And it's, I feel like it's interesting because with Halloween as a film in the horror genre in general, it is this, it, it's almost like the point on which the, uh, the slasher hinges because it takes all these things that happened before. Like you had final, like you had final girl tropes with black Christmas and you had all of these things that happened before Halloween, but Halloween cemented it to such a degree that when you get to scream, it uses Halloween as the framing device for explaining all of this stuff that you're talking about. Yep. Like it is, while it wasn't the first in a lot of ways, it so thoroughly cemented what a slasher is. I knew I invited you on here for a reason. <laughs> I try. <laughs> <laughs> um, so from this pinnacle start in Halloween, she ends up doing the fog prom night. Terror Train, which I didn't know was a thing, which I have to go watch now because I actually think Prom Night's pretty good. 
Um, and then, of course, the Halloween franchise movies. And then she moves on to have a career outside horror. And she has spoken at San Diego Comic-Con saying that she actually does not like horror films, like, at all. Huh. Yeah, so she doesn't like horror. But what she said she does love is she loves the horror audience and the horror fans in general. She calls them the most gentle and most loving of all the fans that she has. I buy it, yeah. The horror community is uh, surprisingly very, very nice. The, the horror community is actually really cuddly, like, honestly. <laughs> It, it's great. Go. I love it. <laughs> I think we've kind of talked about some of the bad stuff. Like the franchise pretty much goes sour once you remove the person. Yeah. And that's, I mean, that's the part that interests me so much about this film franchise is that it has gone on for at this point, 10 films. And the guy who started it left after the second one. Yeah. Uh, and part of that, I think, speaks to studio greed. Part of it speaks to the ambition of the filmmakers, because when John Carpenter said, I will help if it's not about Michael, they said, OK. Yeah. And then we got Halloween three. Like it is it, it is weirdly ambitious for how often it falls flat on its face. Yeah. And, um, and that's the thing, too. Like John Carpenter has come out really, really vocally saying that he doesn't think any of these sequels should have happened. Yeah, he he's been yeah very pretty much against it since he left after three, and even three he I don't think he wanted it to happen. No, he and he was just like his foot was in the door, but he wasn't really doing any heavy lifting. Yeah. Fun it, fact it, though. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say it kind of reminds me of Clive Barker who left Hellraiser production partway through the second film. Yep. Which again, it's because it's like, well, that was his baby, and then the studio was like, well, we want to milk this for that and i feel like that's kind of what probably what went through carpenter's head was like no i had an idea and we've executed my idea i would like if we leave it alone now yep that is pretty much it <laughs> um so even though it was his baby john carpenter does admit to drunkenly writing the scripts and he says that that is the reason why we don't find out that Lori is related until uh related to michael until halfway through two is because he was drunk when writing it so that's a fun fact hmm <laughs> so like sober john carpenter thinks that detail should have come out sooner yes because i feel like what makes michael so ominous is that he seems to have randomly just targeted this one teenager well, it was still gonna come out in two it was the place yeah. two. but like putting it yeah at the end of yeah. two interesting yeah. that's very interesting hmm. again the production side of this is more interesting than the franchise itself to me <laughs> <laughs> exactly which I kind of like, I, I know I put on Twitter. I was like, I'm super excited we're recording this. I don't know how I feel about the franchise as a whole. <laughs> oh, absolutely. So, and it matters because it's still going. Um, this summer, it was announced that October 19th, 2018, there was, and I put here that Universal announced, but it, Jamie Lee Curtis sent out a tweet um, with a picture of her wearing the exact same outfit that she wore in the first one, standing on the same porch with Mike My Michael Myers in the background, like ominously, like by the door. And I got really hyped. And she announced, because she announced that she was going to be reviving her role as Laurie Strode in the franchise. It's um, going to be great. And no, it, is, it, is per, it, it is being produced by Blumhouse and Miramax, which Blumhouse is hit or miss. But I think when Blumhouse hits, it hits it out of the park. Oh, absolutely. Um, yes, it's crushed my soul sometimes. But it, it does have the ability to do great things. Um, Dimension Films no longer has... I think Dimension Films lost the rights in 2015, I think, or something like that. Because Dimension Films... That sounds was, right, was, yeah. Yeah, because Dimension Films had made pretty much all of them. And Dimension Films pretty much made almost all the like horror movies that you remember in like the mid nineties to mid two thousands as yes. well. Um, so for this, John Carpenter is involved again. And that's one of the things that has me really excited too, because he's also producing it with the son of the original producer, uh, Malik Akkad. Um, and then like that has me hyped. John Carpenter has said, I want this to be scarier than the original. I want this to be where the series should have gone. Yeah. Which but, I, oh, go didn't he didn't he say that this movie ignores everything after the yes. first film? Yep. That's that has me very intrigued because he made the second film and he's so he's even throwing out part of his own creation here by doing yep. that. And the the fact that he is involved again does make me very excited because he's walked away from this for like over what, three decades now? Yeah. 
So for him to be coming back, I'm excited. For it to be going back to the roots of the franchise, I'm excited. Um, and honestly, for being Blumhouse, like they are very hit or miss. But like you said, when they hit, they hit out of the park. Yep. We get creep. We get get out. We get the Conjuring. Like they do good work when they do good work. Yep. Exactly. So I'm excited. The only thing that I'm worried about is that the script is co-written with Danny McBride. That actually doesn't worry me. Why? Uh, I listened to a few interviews on... It's come up several times on Nerdist. I think they did an interview with Danny. They did an interview with Jason Blum. And hearing from both of them and kind of hearing the respect that they're coming to this with and uh, his his interest in and background with horror, I kind of trust the guy. I don't like there's just something in hearing them talk about it that I I'm not worried. And I will say this too, I guess after Jordan Peele, like you can't discount somebody with a comedy background coming to horror. That's true. Yeah. He, I remember when Jordan Peele said, I'm going to direct a movie and it's going to be a horror movie. And I was like, I, what? No, don't, don't. And I regret ever having thought that for even a second. But uh, that's all I have. I still don't see why you guys are that excited for this movie. I'm excited because of John Carpenter, but I actually think I'm more excited because I just really love Jamie Lee Curtis and I really love Laurie Strode. So I think that might be what it is for me. I think it's more of an attachment to Jamie Lee Curtis than it is actually attachment to the franchise. This might be a very cynical view, but it just seems like a bunch of old people who want to revive something that they know they can make a ton of money off of and they can basically get this nostalgia factor for a bunch of people or people who even like any of the beginnings. That could be. I, I think yeah. the other thing that gives me a little bit of confidence is that, uh, excluding maybe the Rob Zombie movies, I feel like Halloween has done a better job of backing off when they're screwing up than any other slasher franchise. And there is there is that six year gap between the second one, the third and the second. Yeah, the third, third and, and, and the, the fourth. Second. Excuse me, the third and the fourth one. Yeah, yeah, yeah the third yeah. and the fourth, and then there is a four year gap between H H two O and two and Resurrection, and then there's a six year gap between Halloween five. And so they had a six. They had a six year gap to go from a fourteen score to a six. Six, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but compared to Friday the 13th which released the first movie in 1980 and I think the 8th movie in 1989 yeah, <laughs> well, yeah. Uh, and I think honestly I don't think that the slasher genre is completely exhausted at this point although I also don't think it's a genre that needs to constantly be turning things on its head I think it's okay to just make a good slasher and I'm excited to see if they can do that in 2018 I think it's a genre that has yet to adapt to technology because technology complicates all of the things that make a slasher scary. Like slashers have not fully adapted to modern technology and all of the things that make, you know, randomly murdering a bunch of people over the course of a night practic- impractical. Yeah. Final thoughts on Halloween, guys. <laughs> Adrian, since you came in with like creepy child. Um the creepy child apparently is the last creepy thing about this franchise. <laughs> and I will probably will not be watching any of them because it is all crazy and me still. <laughs> but I understand and I appreciate what it's done and I'm glad it brings you guys joy and Alex joy when he's reading Wikipedia articles and novelizations <laughs> of stuff. So I'm I'm good there. <laughs> What about you, Matt? One, I think it's funny to the child is creepy because the funniest thing and probably the most white, one other reason why it doesn't seem to stand the test of time, like you talk about a little bit, is when he's like in full like leather over or a black like onesie suit that he wears and the mask and everything in broad daylight. Oh, yeah. Like that is probably even more creepy of like, why is this guy walking around like yeah. this? And nobody seems to care, notice, or anything. The weirdest part, because I hadn't seen the first Halloween in at least 10 years before I watched it today, there's this part where Michael Myers is driving down the street in a car with the window down, staring out yeah. at Laurie Strode and her friends. Yeah. And, yeah. And her friend just, and then, and then he speeds off, and her friend doesn't say anything about the creepy guy in a mask staring at them. She says, speed kills! And then, yeah. 
And then when he pops up around the corner again, like, what? Were you going to say it? No, I didn't even say anything. I just got to say about half a sentence, and then I'll let you talk for the next five minutes. But don't worry. Thanks for saying all my final thoughts. (laughs) (laughs) But anyways, besides that, my final thoughts of this series is I have seen them. It's been a long time to see them. I probably doubt I'll ever really watch them again. I don't really... They were cool when I guess I was a kid. My family loves them. I don't care for them that much. Buster Rhymes is cool. I still don't get why we're making this new one. Come up with new original ideas. I'd rather see Buckethead Murder Tree or Broadway Killer than watch another stupid Halloween movie. Even though I still think these ratings are a little off in some way. <laughs> I got that. Jaws. Jaws. Yeah. I rewatched everything. And these movies do not stand up to the test of time other than Jamie Lee Curtis as a pretty awesome final girl because she fights the entire time. And that's pretty much all I have to say about it. And that H2O is my favorite one out of all of them and Rob Zombies weren't that bad. Feel free to at me. Yeah. I feel like with this, just what I find most interesting is that it is, in terms of like why it matters, is that it is sort of a cautionary tale about studio greed. Uh, and it's just very interesting that it did its most important work in the first two films in terms of cementing the slasher genre. Yeah, that is really like, true. Like, those are the two big things that I fixate on with this franchise. So, interesting question, I guess, Alice will think. We keep talking about Jamie Lee Curtis, which she was in, I guess, most of them. But wasn't Dr. Loomis, I believe, in almost all of them as well? He's been in more of them than her. He's in the four. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's what I'm saying. He's that's from, why it was kind of... one to four, I believe. <laughs> yeah, that's the only reason kind of like, because we never really mentioned him, but you went on this whole spiel about, I guess, because what Jamie Lee Curtis did, but like he was, it seemed to be a very integral part of the actual series. At least to me, he was more integral than actually Jamie Lee Curtis was, at least when I grew up. In... Yeah, no, I mean, he was more, I, I, I like Jamie Lee Curtis as a character and an actress, but I, I mentioned it in the beginning that like Dr. Loomis is the one who from the beginning, one thinks that that Michael Myers is an animal and not a human. And two, keeps telling everybody, hey, he's still alive. Why are you not looking for him when everybody else is just like, no, he died. It's fine. Yeah, Loomis is like an ignored mortal enemy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Or like maybe just the Paul Revere of this franchise. (laughs) <laughs> like constantly running around trying to warn everybody and just but like nobody listens for some reason. Yeah, that that's really accurate. <laughs> and since I've been out of town, I didn't actually get to look this up. Is the only reason he ended up being out of these films then because he actually died in real life, the actor? Or not? I don't know. Did he die? Actually, let's look this up. Because I'm pretty because I could have sworn at least I thought the only reason they ended up either he ended up either dying in the series or leaving the thing was because the actor actually died. So. Oh, I know he is in all of them. He yeah, he's in like all of them. That's what I was like. Oh, why seriously? we didn't? Yeah, that's why I could sworn he was like in all of them and everything. Like, yeah, I... he dies in 1998. Yeah, he died in 1998. That was when they I could sworn they killed him off the series. As a character, not the guy. Yeah, but I thought the actual air character, the actor, actually ended up dying. Yeah, he's in all of them. Yeah, he's a main character in the first two films, the fourth, the fifth, and the sixth film. Yeah, he is in all of that's them. That's why I was kind of weird why we did not talk to him about him at all, really. You know, I no, thought he was way well, more of a main why? character than actually Rory you know Stroud was. Because I did the notes and I skipped all of the Jamie movies, which are four. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I watched, like, I watched four and then I skipped five and six. Because that's not like, oh, Jamie Lee Curtis, blah, blah, blah. I was like, I remember this guy way more than anything about Jamie Lee Curtis. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like he's he's got to be Solid. fulfilling some literary trope that I just can't name at the moment. Uh, Donald Pleasance and then Malcolm McDowell. Okay, so it's two different people? I think Malcolm McDowell was probably in the um, in yeah, the, you know, he the died zombie in ones. Yeah, that's yeah. What I said the guy actually died. Yeah, he died in '95, which was the very last. Minute. Yeah, because yeah. they kill him off in this movie because the guy actually died in real life. Oh. <laughs> that's why I could have sworn they killed him off, and the only reason he died in the series was literally because he died in real life. So when we start doing a wormhole again, we can talk more about Loomis. Yeah. Because honestly, like, I missed a big piece. That's on me for show notes. <laughs> Wait. You oh, yeah, you I, I, yeah. I think I covered it with uh, the idea of it cementing slashers and all that. Yeah. Uh, that's kind of like those are th- that. The, yeah. Cementing slashers is like the really, really big thing with this one. 
uh, and then the production aspect and the studio greed and all that. But also like the, uh, you know, it, it's a, it's a fun movie to watch, uh, especially around, you know, Halloween. And um, it's one of the three most iconic slashers of all time. So. Yeah. Cause when you think, when you go into a Halloween store, there are three people, Jason, Freddie, and Michael Myers. Also, we didn't get into it, but I find it very interesting that John Carpenter refers to Michael Myers as the shape and really? not as Michael. Huh. I didn't know that. God, this can go on for another hour. Okay. So. <laughs> it could. We, we won't let it. But yeah, if you look it up, a lot of, there's a lot of documentation and, and interviews and stuff where he's referred to as the shape. That's really interesting. Why don't you tell everybody where they can find you? Yeah, uh, I am on Twitter at most always Alex. And as Kate said, I have my other podcast, what we talk about when we talk about, and I work at Friday.com where we review horror movies. And you can find this podcast at, but why though PC on Instagram and Twitter. And you can find me at, Oh, my myth Randier on Twitter and Instagram. Adrian. Yeah. You can find me on Twitter at super reason 93 S U P D E R R U I Z 93. Matt? And you can find me on Twitter at dat m18 d a t t m18. Do I have to ask what your exit music is, Alex? Uh, actually, let's just go not with the Silver Shamrock song. Let's just play Season of the Witch. Ah! Look at you. That's actually a really good song. All right? Yep. Okay, bye! bye. Season of